Shalom Aleichem, Boker Tov, peace be upon you and good morning to Mikael once again here on May 14th, 2014. And we also have ER 145999. I'm going to go ahead and get right into it, open up with a spirit of prayer. We're going to get right to Revelation 3. Chazon uh, uh, Shalosh. Chazon Shalosh. So with that, Hallelujah. Blessed are you, Yah Almighty One, King of the Universe, the Elohim of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Creator of Heaven, Earth, Sea, and all that is in them. Abba, we thank you for once again causing our being to be restored and opening our eyes and return to the land of the living in peace. We thank you for a night's rest, Heavenly Father, that has caused us to restore and refresh our being. And we want to now confess our sins and ask that you pardon us and have mercy upon us so that we may stand before you and have boldness, Heavenly Father, to approach your throne in a clear conscience. We want to offer our being unto you, Heavenly Father, as an acceptable offering and an acceptable sacrifice and ask that you continue to transform our hearts and our minds, circumcise our hearts so that we may truly walk according to your ways, our God, and live according to your precepts. We want to ask that you provide understanding for us at this hour and that you allow your teachings to just fall on us like dew on the meadows, Heavenly Father. Continue to open our eyes to the wonders of your Torah and your word and help us, Heavenly Father, to be a light that shines in a dark place. We pray these things in the name of our high priest, king, redeemer, rabbi, bridegroom, prophet, Mashiach, Yahushua, Baruch Hashem, Hallelujah, and Amen. So we're going to get right into this particular chapter. Uh, we're going to read the first 11 verses, and then we're going to get into the latter 11 verses. So let's just go right into it for the sake of time. Revelation 3, starting at verse 1. And to the messenger of the assembly in Sardis, write, He who has the seven spirits of Elohim and the seven stars says this, I know your works and that you have a name, that you are alive, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before Elohim. Remember then how you have received and heard. And watch and repent. If then you do not wake up, I shall come upon you as a thief, and you shall not know at all what hour I come upon you. Nevertheless, you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be dressed in white robes, and I shall by no means blot out his name from the book of life, but I shall confess his name before my father and before his messengers. Verse 6. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. And to the messenger of the assembly in Philadelphia, write, He who is set apart, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one is able to shut it, that you have little power, that you have guarded my word and have not denied my name. See, I am giving up those of the congregation of Satan, who say they are Yehudim and are not, but lie. See, I am making them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you, because you have guarded my word of endurance. I also shall guard you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon all the world to try those who dwell on the earth. See, I am coming speedily. Hold what you have, that no one take your crown. So, um, what we're going to do is uh, pretty much um, look at these assemblies. And Sardis uh, was a wealthy inland city uh, of Asia Minor. And um, they had a very successful Jewish community there, and it was also a house of a, the, the place of a huge synagogue in the diaspora. It was built and expanded over uh, the third through the seventh centuries. Um, the Jews there, they had good relationships with non-Jews, and so there was a, a huge presence in Sardis of 
um, the diaspora community. And so um, this is why you can see some of the characteristics there. Uh, you know, I know your works that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So it was like they were leaning on this Israelite community, you know, who supposedly had a name and a reputation in the diaspora. But they were dead because they were so lavish and so materially um, established. And, um, you know, if, if you really continue to look at this historically, it will flesh out pretty much everything that is um, about this matter here. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, they had to go ahead and, and really be rebuked for their leaning on this this uh, renown, so to speak, this name, you know, this great influence and regal life that they had been living in the diaspora. But that wasn't what y'all wanted. He wanted them to have substance, not just to be known for their uh, success and the wealth that many people, even to this day, you know, rely on as, as, if, it, as if it is their salvation. So um, he goes and tells them to wake up and strengthen what remains. If you look at uh, Isaiah 52, verses 1 through 2, let's do this. Let's keep it there and go on this one here. Isaiah 52, verses 1 and 2 says this. It says, awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bands of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. So this diaspora, right? Strengthen what remains and is about to die. You have to understand this whole book is about restoration. It is a reclaiming of one's inheritance because Israel had disobeyed they found themselves in the diaspora you find that the promises that were um, given to Abraham Isaac and Jacob and their descendants relate to a geographic location um, but once they had gone into the diaspora these these bands around the neck that have been tightened not only are the uh, what's the word I'm looking for affliction in the in the in the bondage and the oppression but also the assimilation the 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 wanting to be like the gentiles and they took on the yoke of the nations as opposed to keeping the yoke of the kingdom upon their neck and that yoke is the profession of the shema which declares every day that you know yah is one and he is our elohim and that we are the ambassadors and emissaries and plenty potentiaries and envoys and the representatives the governmental officials of his kingdom and if that is our yoke that is what we are to to bear and not any other uh, matter whatsoever and so when you look at this here you know um, the dust of the earth is also another metaphor for the people Okay, remember Adam was taken from the dust of the earth. He was taken from amongst people. The earth is older than 6,000 years old. I'm not going to get too deep into that. Abraham was told that his descendants shall be as numerous as the dust of the earth. Okay, so these are all metaphors. These are all uh, um, allusions to uh, people. The dust of the earth is an allusion to people. Okay, and so um, come out of that particular matter strengthen it and complete your works okay this means continue to observe your um, instructions that have been given to you we can then go to the third verse he says remember then how you have received we're going to look at Romans 10 uh, 14 through 17 remember how you have received okay and this is also a quote from Isaiah Romans 10 we're going to look at 14 through 17 it says how then Shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the good news of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. 
but they have not all obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Yah, who has believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of Elohim. Okay, so it asks the question, remember how you have received and heard. So remember, Israel came to these Gentiles. Okay, and this is why when you read in the Romans 11, it talks about don't boast against the root. Okay, remember how you have received and how you have heard. You heard through Israel, the nation who was to be the blessing unto all the nations. Okay. Um, watch and repent so we know about repentance again about bearing fruit worthy of repentance and, and that is through obeying the instructions and the commandments if you do not wake up I shall come upon you as a thief and you shall not know at what hour that I come we're going to look at uh, verse uh, Luke 12 35 through 40 Let's take a look at the book of Luke okay. witness of Luke 12 verses 35 through 40 it says this let your loins be girded about your about and your lights burning okay so let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks they may open him unto him immediately blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes shall find watching verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or if or come in the third watch and find them so blessed and find them so blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Okay, so they're saying he's coming as a thief. This is why we have to be watchful and prayerful. This is what the Messiah told his disciples, the three, Yaakov, Yachanan, and Kipha, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Watch and pray. Okay, so that is verse 3. In verse 4, we see that those who's, uh, who have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, They've not gotten caught up and associated in all the mess and all the uh, idolatrous ways, okay? Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 9 and verse 8 says this. Ecclesiastes 9 and 8. This is a little different order than I'm used to. So let me just do this. Kohaleth, the convener, chapter 9 and verse 8. It says this. Let your garments be white at all times. and Let your head lack no oil. Let your garments be white at all times and let your head lack no oil. So this means you have to be righteous. You have to be set apart. You have to be clean. And you have to have the anointing. Let your head be anointed. This means the knowledge of the Father is always on you. So that the Spirit can reside in your temple. You are the temple. Okay. Let that be the matter. Let your garments be white at all times. And let your head lack no oil. Okay. Keep <laughs> meditating on this word day and night. This is what the scripture is talking about. Okay. Um, that's how our garments are not defiled. We produce righteous fruit, okay? We'll read later, but the white robes or the white linen, the fine linen, is the righteousness of the set-apart ones. What they call um, the kadoshim in Hebrew, the set-apart ones. Okay? They shall walk with me and uh, be worthy. Let's look at, uh, to get a better understanding of some things real quick, let's look at Exodus 28. Verses 1 through 4. It says this. And you bring near Aharon, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel for serving as priests to meet. Now keep in mind, Israel is a priestly nation. They are royal priesthood. Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, the sons of Aharon. And you shall make set apart garments for Aharon, your brother, for esteem and for comeliness. Okay. And you speak 
to all the wise of heart whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, and they shall make the garments of Aharon to set him apart for him to serve as priest to me. And these are the garments which they make, a breastplate, a shoulder garment, a robe, an embroidered long shirt, a turban, and a girdle. And they shall make set-apart garments for Aharon, your brother, and his sons, for him to serve as priests to me. So these are the set-apart garments, okay, that the priesthood wore that allowed them to officiate in that capacity, okay. And it is much like anyone who wears a, wears a uniform. When they are in that uniform, they are serving in the capacity which they are um, ordained, okay. It is the same thing for Israel. We have to wear these garments of righteousness so that we can minister to the nations as the priests. And that garment that is worn are the garments of righteousness. We have to exude the principles of Torah. Okay? That is what this is about. If we're not exuding and bearing that fruit, again, the axe is already at the root of the tree to chop it down. Okay, so we read that. Let's look at first. Um, let's look at Colossians 1. 19 9 through 13 Colossians 1 9 through 13 as far as again walking worthily now we need to walk worthily okay it says uh, that is also why we from the day we heard have not ceased praying for you and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of his desire and all wisdom and spiritual understanding to walk worthily of the master okay pleasing all bearing fruit there it is again in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of elohim being empowered with all power according to the might of his esteem for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the father who has made us fit to share in the inheritance of the set apart ones in the light who has delivered us from the authority of darkness and transferred us into the reign of the son of his love okay so to walk worthily of the master if you're called you need to respond to that call in kind you're called to be set apart okay he who calls on the name of the master let him turn away from wickedness this is what we have to understand um verse seven we read now to the messenger of the philadelphia who set apart true he who has the key of Dawid, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Okay, to understand the key of Dawid, we need to go back to 2 Samuel. Okay, this is 2 Samuel, it's the seventh chapter. We're going to look at verses 8 through 16. 2 Samuel, seventh chapter, 8 through 16. It says, and now, this is Yah speaking to Nathan or Nathan. Say to my servant, Dawid, thus said Yah of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I've been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great ones who are on the earth. And I shall appoint a place for my people Israel, and shall plant them. And they shall dwell in a place of their own and no longer be afraid. Neither shall the children of wickedness oppress them again as at the first. Even from the day I commanded rulers over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. And Yah has declared to you that he would make you a house. When your days are filled and, your, and you rest with your fathers, I shall raise up your seed after you who comes from your inward parts and shall establish his reign. He does build a house for my name, and I shall establish the throne of his reign forever. Okay. I think I said through 16. Yes, I did. So I am to be his father, and he is my son. If he does perversely, I shall reprove him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my loving commitment does not turn aside from his, as I turned it aside from Shaul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your reign are to be steadfast forever before you. Your throne is established forever. So the keys of Dawid are the rulership of the kingdom, okay, through the tribe of Yahuda. This again goes back to Genesis 49. We had read that a little while ago. And how uh, the scepter is to not to depart from Yahuda, okay, and a lawgiver from between his legs or his loins. His seed is what that's speaking of. 
and so excuse me uh, this is really what this is all about um, and I missed something I want to go back let me digress Matthew uh, 10 in relationship to um, confessing in uh, verse 5 it says I shall confess his name before my father and before his messengers um, and I, I overlooked this this is Matthew 10 related to verse 5 we just related to verse 7 uh, with second uh, second Samuel 7 but Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33 again about this confession it says everyone therefore who shall confess me before men him I also shall confess before my father who is in the heavens but whoever shall deny me before men him I shall also deny before my father who is in the heavens so this is how the father will have your name confessed before you if you confess his son's name before other men okay and so um, now back to Philadelphia and the um, key of Dawid that is related to the rulership again that was promised to Dawid of the kingdom okay and that door no one can shut or open is a matter of Yah truly establishing the kingdom through them interestingly Herod sat on the throne but Herod's throne was full of tumult Okay, it wasn't the one that was readily accepted in in the whole nation of Israel, particularly even in Yahuda, in the township or the uh, locale or the jurisdiction or province of Judea. Okay, so he goes on in verse eight. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one is able to shut it. That you have little power. You have guarded my name and have not denied it. So there it is again about that confession. But let's look about this door. Let's look at Acts fourteen. And we're going to look at verses 19 to 28. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says this. Yehudim arrived from Antioch and Iconian, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Shaul, dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. But while the taught ones gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and on the next day he went away with Barnaba to Derbe. And having brought the good news to that city, and having made many taught ones, they returned to Lustra and Iconian, and Antioch, strengthening the beings of the taught ones, encouraging them to continue in the belief, and that through many pressures we have to enter the reign of Elohim. And having appointed elders, elders in every in every assembly, having prayed with fasting, they committed them to the master in whom they had believed. And having passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And having spoken the word in Pergi, they went down to Atalea. And from there they sailed to Antioch where they had been committed to the favor of Elohim for the work which they had completed. And having arrived and having gathered together the assembly, they related all that Elohim had done with them, and that he had opened the door of belief to the nations, and they remained there a long time with the taught ones. So to open the door of the belief to the nations, the door that opens is one that allows souls to enter. And the father chooses who is allowed to enter and the father who chooses who is not allowed to enter okay so this door that he opens and no one shuts and open shuts and no one opens is completely at the discretion of the father okay <clears throat> um, verse 9 we had talked about these um, false Yehudim or these false Jews who say they're Jews but are not but they're going to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Let's look at Isaiah 60 on this note. We're going to look at Isaiah 60, verses 9 through 16. It reads on this slide. Because the coastlands wait for me. Okay, these are the isles of the Gentiles. And the ships of Tarshish first. This is Portugal. Who were the first people in Europe to trade the um, western the, the western coast of um, slaves or uh, the Africans from the western coast which actually had a coast of uh, Judeans as well okay well, I'll put a map up there of that um, the ships of Tarships first to bring your sons from afar their silver and their gold with them to the name of Yah your Elohim and to the set apart one of Israel because he has adorned you and the sons of foreigners shall build your walls and the sovereign serve you. For in my wrath I have stricken you, but in my delight 
I shall have compassion on you. This is because they were disobedient, but now because they returned in their distress, the Father will restore their captivity or, return, or turn back their captivity. And your gates shall be open continually, and they are not shut day or night to bring to you the wealth of the nations and their sovereigns in procession. For the nations and the reigns that do not serve you shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The esteem of Lebanon shall come to you, cypress, pine, and the box tree together to embellish the place of my set-apart place, and I shall make the place of my feet esteem, and the sons of those who afflicted you come bowing to you. The sons of those who afflicted you come bowing to you, right? And all those who despise you shall bow themselves at the soles of your feet. And they shall call you the city of Yah, Zion, of the set apart one of Israel. Instead of you being forsaken and hated so that no one passes through you, I shall make you an everlasting excellence, a joy of many generations. And you shall suck the milk of the nations and shall suckle the breast of sovereigns. And you shall know that I, Yah, your Savior and your Redeemer, am the mighty one of Yah Akov. Only our obedience to Yah's Torah which will allow his Shekinah to dwell upon us, will allow for this matter to take place. We have to show the world who we are, okay? The chosen people are the most despised people on earth. And it is not by coincidence that the people who look like my face globally are the most despised for whatever reason. All right, we know the reason is because the covenant is with us and we bear the signs of all these things. But we have to realize this and return to the Father, okay? We have to return to the Father. And this is not a matter of race. Let's make this real clear. It's not a matter of race whatsoever. It is a matter of national, nas uh, what is it called? Nationhood. It is a matter of nationhood. So nationalism is an issue, yes, but the Father is a nationalist. He has chosen one nation out of all the nations on earth. Now, that does not mean that we are arrogant. That does not mean that we are boastful. That does not mean that we are uh, supremacists in our ideology. But it means that we are confident in who we are and we exude that. And we bear the fruits of righteousness in love and compassion. And we show the nations who the true and living Elohim of uh, creation is. That is what this comes down to. Um, so they will come bowing at our feet. In humble prostration knowing that Elohim is with us and that's the only way they'll bow they have to be made to witness the power of the presence of the Father upon us okay and that's written it is written okay so those who have despised us will end up turning their hearts around because they will see <laughs> the esteem of the Father on his people verse uh it says because you have guarded my word of endurance I shall also guard you from the hour of trial Which shall come upon all the world To try those who dwell on the earth Let's look at Zephaniah 2 And then we're going to go to Zechariah as well So let's look at Zephaniah 2 And see what the Father is talking about This hour of trial should come To try all the nations To everyone who dwells on earth It says gather together Gather together, O nation without shame. This is a nation who is now shameless in their acts. And if you look at, well, let me not. Gather together, gather together, O nation without shame. Before the law gives birth, the day shall pass on like chaff. Before the burning wrath of Yah comes upon you. Before the day of wrath of Yah comes upon you. Seek Yah, all you meek ones of the earth who have done his right ruling. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. If so, be that you are hidden in the day of wrath of Yah. Okay. So it's coming. The day of wrath is coming to try every individual on the face of this earth. But it talks about he shall, uh, verse 10, guard you from the hour of trial. Well, listen to this. This is Zechariah 12. We're going to start at verse 6 and we're going to go through verse 8. It says, in that day, I make the leaders of Yehuda like a fire pot <clears throat> among trees. I make the leaders of Yehuda like a fire pot among trees and like a torch of fire in the sheaves. 
and they shall consume all the peoples all around, everyone that dwells on earth, right? On the right and on the left. And Yerushalayim shall dwell again in her own place, in Yerushalayim. And Yah shall save the tents of Yehuda first, so that the comeliness of the house of Dawid and the comeliness of the inhabitants of Yerushalayim would not become greater than that of Yehuda. In that day, Yah shall shield the inhabitants of Yerushalayim. And the feeble among them in that day shall be like Dawid, and the house of Dawid like Elohim, like the messenger of Yah before them. He shall shield the inhabitants of Yerushalayim. Really? Is this why there's such a huge prophetic push coming from this group of Israelites who say there's salvation in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel? Exactly. Exactly. Okay, this is the ark of the last day. Okay, in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. This is why we push for Israel to return home for salvation. Okay, I'm going to pause here and come back for uh, the next part two.